and uh, we're so thankful to have an extra large room for our meeting this month, and we can thank Stephanie Chang for that, for making special arrangements for us. I'm glad you all found it. And uh, my name is Giovanna Ambezi, and I lead LACNETS. Um, I want to give a thank you to Cedar sinai They have hosted us for the last two years and provided us with a wonderful room to meet in and our food and beverages. So let's give Cedars a thank you for very important support. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Cindy Kofelt, who has been our facilitator. Um, she is going to be out for a bit on a medical leave, and we want to wish her a very quick recovery and best wishes. A couple of other short announcements. Um, Ruth Castro, where are you, Ruth? Ruth it has singularly been responsible for getting um, California proclaimed uh, as a state participating in Net Cancer Day, which was November 10th. And at this point, we, I think, got almost all of the states except Alaska. Um, and Ruth actually brought, she took the day off from work to, to be here today, and she brought the actual proclamation from Senator Kevin DeLeon. Uh, and we'd all like to take a photo afterwards if you'd like to be part of that to send to the senator. Um, there's a uh, celebration of life for Jan Naratomi Hart, which is going to be January 3rd in Los Angeles. And uh, one clinical trial update. Um, I know some people have been interested in the new clinical trial for carcinoid syndrome, which is through lexicon pharmaceuticals. This is for telitrostat epidrate. And Dr. Wollen had first mentioned this um, many months ago when he spoke about clinical trials. They have a new offering now. They're offering to pay for reimbursing travel for a patient and a companion to either Dr. Wallen in Kentucky or um, Pamela Coombs at Stanford. And this is a really amazing offer, for, especially for people who suffer from carcinoid syndrome. And the trial allows um, improvement in symptoms. You can be on it concurrent with sandostatin. Um, so if you're interested in that, they're, they're covering the travel once a month to either location. Um, you can speak with Sandra Lewis, who is in the back there. And uh, we're also trying to get this trial going at Cedars. If there's enough interest, it's possible. The trial is going to be um, closing enrollment early 2015. And there's a video online. I'll send out the link. Um, which is a really great description of the, the trial and their uh, published phase two results. Um, and I think uh, we are going to be planning a LACNATS half day conference in February 2015 and um, having similar to what we did last year with Caring for Carcinoid Foundation. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It's gonna be a half day. Uh, we're hoping to do a mock tumor board with Dr. Nissen and the tumor board team, um, so that don't miss that one. Date to be announced. Um, and as most of you know, our dear nurse, Arpi, uh, is retiring tomorrow. Um, many of us know her very intimately. And um, so we're uh, looking forward to the news on that and saying goodbye to RP. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce we our, our speakers today. Um, we are very fortunate, this is exceptional, that the schedule's aligned, the planet's aligned, <laughs> and um, we have Dr. Robert Figlin and Stephanie Chang with us today. Robert Figlin's, uh, Dr. Figlin's credits, uh, as well as being the Deputy Director for the Samuel Lovshin Comprehensive Cancer Institute. He is also a Professor of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences and the Steven Spielberg Family Chair in Hematology and Oncology. So please welcome Dr. Figlin. Thank you so much. Well, it's nice to be here and uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Um, so what I, what I want to do in the next block of time is kind of talk a little bit about Cedars, 
talk a little bit about our commitment to neuroendocrine tumors. Um, also give you opportunities to ask questions. Uh, don't make them too hard. And uh, we'll go from there. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a Philadelphian by choice. I grew up in Philadelphia, came to Los Angeles many years ago. Uh, spent the first 26 years of my career at UCLA. Climbed the academic ranks to chair professor. Spent the next five years of my career uh, running City of Hope and came to Cedars in 2010 because uh, Cedars has really quite a unique opportunity to translate science on behalf of all of you and the patients that I take care of. For those of you that know or don't know, uh, I'm a, an expert in kidney cancer and general urinary malignancies as well as in lung cancer. Spent my career basically developing uh, drugs and still do. Um, so one of the things that, that I think is unique about CEDARS that, that is important for everybody to understand and appreciate is um, we're a very large organization. Probably many of you don't know how large. Uh, we see more cancer patients at CEDARS than anybody, but anyone else in Southern Cal California. Um, more than UCLA, more than City of Hope, more than USC, more than the Providence system. 4,500 new patients come to Cedars on an annual basis. We're second in the state uh, for taking care of cancer patients. Uh, the only other institution that exceeds us is University of California, San Francisco, which has a very large community practice. So we're very big. And, and uh, one of the nice things about, about Cedars is we are, uh, in my view, very patient-centric. And what that means is that our decisions, our plans, our goals, our education, our research are really centered around the, uh, the patient. As I was walking over here today, <clears throat> and I was looking through my 32 emails, um, one of the emails that we got that we only took us a year to get was a $12.2 million grant from the NIH to study prostate cancer under Leland Chung, who we recruited eight years ago. So we're, we're a pretty big player in the cancer space. Recently had a external advisory board meeting um, in Southern California just over the last weekend with experts from Ohio State, Duke, Vanderbilt, and other places. So we think about things in terms of, of what we can contribute both to the individual and to um, the disease. Uh, when I got here in 2010, um, many of you know and have loved Dr. Walwyn. Uh, um, my first job in, in when I met uh, Ed was to get him to focus on neuroendocrine tumors. So you have me to thank for that, actually. <laughs> because when I got here, his practice was incredibly diffuse. He took care of a lot of different kinds of diseases but his expertise was in neuroendocrine tumor. And I found ways to support those other patients in a different way. And about two years into his time here, he was spending 100% of his time taking care of the disease that's most important to you. And that would really have never occurred without the, the vision of the institution to support uh, pe people who are struggling with neuroendocrine disease wherever it occurs. Um, it's also important to know that, that um, the term neuroendocrine is actually taking on increasingly important uh, connotations. Most, most people think about neuroendocrine tumors as arriving, arising in the pancreas or the lung or associated with carcinoid. Um, there's actually a very important uh, piece of scientific information that uh, an increasing concern for many of us in the cancer community is neuroendocrine tumors of the prostate gland. And prostate cancer and neuroendocrine disease of the pros of prostate cancer is also starting to raise its head in light of many patients who have received very effective therapy, but their tumor changes over time to have what's called a neuroendocrine phenotype. So that's also critically important. So some of the things that I, I think would be best for me to share with you before Stephanie talks to you about some of the logistics are, one, our commitment. Um, neuroendocrine tumors are 
diseases which require multidisciplinary approaches. There is not a single doctor who can manage neuroendocrine disease. And I suspect if I asked you in the audience to raise your hands, many of you have seen a variety of physicians, surgeons, interventional radiologists, pathologists behind the scenes, medical oncologists, who are trying to figure out how best to take care of you. And, and I'm proud to say that, that we, CEDARS, and, our, and the neuroendocrine program that you've helped to support, is really a program that's 16 people wide in terms of expertise across uh, surgical expertise, interventional radiology expertise, pathology, medical oncology, nursing, research. So um, when uh, Ed came into my office many months ago and said, uh, my wife and I are thinking about going to uh, some other place in the country, I don't even think I've ever visited the state that he's currently in. <laughs> um, but I do watch the basketball games from some of their teams. Um, we did everything we could to try and change Ed's mind. So uh, the reality is, is that sometimes individuals just like you and I make decisions that are in relationship to our families, which take a precedent. Uh, we tried uh, very much so to find ways to ask him to stay. And uh, that was not successful, but it was not successful for lack of effort. Um, went right up to the top at the institution myself, Dr. Melman, Dr. Piantadosi, and, and Ed, in the, in the final uh, setting, uh, made a personal decision with he and Sue. And of course, what we, what we wanted to do in that setting is support him. You support people that you care about, even when they make decisions that you wish they didn't make, as many of you, I'm sure, can identify with. Um, before Ed left, we put together a search, team, a search group, um, and we are now searching for a leader of the Cedars Neuroendocrine Medical Oncology Program. Uh, we have looked nationwide. Uh, we had a short list of three candidates that we uh, had spoken with and invited. And now we have a very shorter list of one candidate that we are now uh, having conversations with. And we hope to have this position filled by the end of the year uh, with that person starting soon thereafter. So I can commit to you that, that Cedar sinai has a strong and continuing commitment to diseases associated with neuroendocrine tumors that we are seeking, have identified, and will we'll certainly support a, uh, uh, the highest quality uh, person. Um, our, our, our phenotype of such a person is really a, a physician investigator. It's not a person who just sees patients but is asking and answering questions that we all want to ask and answer to change the field. Um, we expect that all of the trials that will be available uh, for neuroendocrine tumors will take place here. Um, Ed certainly has le left us with an incredible legacy, which we will continue and see no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. Just as a, a, back a, back a, a backdrop, um, we placed, uh, we'll place over 300 patients on clinical trials at Cedars in 2014. We have a centralized clinical research office of just over 50 people. We do everything from investigational new drug applications to research and support staff, very vigorous across all diseases, um, clearly with expertise in neuroendocrine tumors. And, and we expect that we will be a destination for those clinical trials just because of the things that we know how to do um, and have, have been sought out by our colleagues in, in the pharmaceutical industry and the cooperative groups uh, to do that. Uh, we don't expect any other transitions in our neuroendocrine program. Our surgeons, our interventional radiologists, nurses are staying. So our group is really uh, very concentrated and, and will continue and we will fill the missing piece. Um, I can make that commitment to you and at some point in the future I'll come back and tell you who that is. Um, and I can tell you that it's, our goals are to identify a person who already has great national experience and uh, great national and international exposure in these diseases. In addition, we also have other expertise. For example, one of the things that we did when Ed was transitioning is is we have Ron Natale, who's the head of our thoracic oncology program, 
Ron has 25 years of experience in, in neuroendocrine, carcinoids of the lung, et cetera, so we have expertise in that area that continues. We have the busiest thoracic oncology practice in the state, Big Rob McKenna. So in terms of our numbers, our volume, our capacity, our expertise, um, I, I don't think we'll be able to struggle to uh, continue to find the expertise necessary to offer you the care that you expect. So before I take questions, I, I just want to leave you with um, what you can do for us. That's what we're going to do for you. Um, and, and, and advocacy is absolutely critical in care of, of cancer patients. What do I mean by that? Uh, the NIH budget continues to shrink. Uh, for diseases like neuroendocrine tumors, the dollars committed to neuroendocrine patients are pretty modest at a federal level. Um, uh, the dollars that are committed to the diseases from the federal government are uh, lobbied heavily in the areas of breast, prostate, um, lung, uh, GI cancers. Um, so uh, advocacy is absolutely uh, important. I think secondly, I would just tell you that fundraising is critical and, and I wish all the, all the resources would come to Cedars, but fundraising and placing it where it has the greatest return on investment is absolutely important, whether that's fundraising for staff that helps people get through the system or research that supports investigators initiated research. It's, it's really quite expensive to ask and answer questions. Um, some of the struggles that many of us have in the investigator community is that often, as you just illustrated by the trial that's being started where they're uh, flying you to here and flying you to there, um, you know that the reason that they're doing that is because that's enlightened self-interest. And that's okay. I mean, if a company wants their studies to be done, and they want the answers to be gotten, then they're going to pay for the resources to make that occur. The problem with that is that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best question, it's the best resource, the best place to put our investment dollars. And what I hope you will advocate for is a series of research questions that can move the needle in a significant way. Um, you know, one of the things that's what happens as you get a little bit older, and I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm younger or older than I look, depending upon how your eyes are doing. <laughs> um, you know, is is time is precious. It's correct, and that's the only thing that we don't have any control over. But what we do have the control over is how to invest and support the time that we have, and and how you choose to do that as a group. Um, is critically important. I hope you have uh, advisors that can help you do that. I hope you credit the institutions that can support it. And I hope that you remember that my being here today is really just our, our, an evidence of our continuing commitment to the diseases that you struggle with and our, our desire to have an impact. So I'll stop there, have a sip of water, and try and answer questions. Thanks so much. If you have a question and want to come up to the mic, that's okay. Fire <laughs> Doctor, thank you for coming today. You're welcome. I think uh, probably we all heard a lot of things we wanted to hear, and maybe you answered a few of our questions already. Uh, John Tuturo, a patient here uh, with a successful liver resection recently. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it was metastatic illness from a lung carcinoma. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I have so many things to ask and inquire. I'm only going to ask one because I think you've done a good job today and I'll give someone else a chance. It has to do with a, a program I saw that was developed by European uh, researchers for mapping out uh, surgical procedures. A specifically liver resection of metastatic illness uh, that showed a 3D model that surgeons used during procedure to plan their operation. In fact, the program provided a surgical plan so that very little was missed or overlooked in the procedure. Uh, is this something you're aware of or 
So, not only am I aware of it, but let me let me expand on that. So, Interesting. Um, when when Cedars made the commitment, uh, probably eight to ten years ago, to become a uh, NCI designated cancer center, one of the one of the aspects of that commitment is trying to recruit people like myself and others. Um, but what you may not be aware of is you may not be aware of our recruitment in in uh, research radiology. So we recruited Bio Lee from Northwestern, who leads a monster team looking at novel imaging methods to examine cancer in the operating room for the purposes of identifying where the margins should be, how to save normal tissue, how to not do things that are unnecessary. So we have actually a very large program in that. It's not just in liver cancer. So again, just to give you a, um, some macro view, which you, which you may not be aware of. So we're, we're the largest transplant center for certain kinds of transplants in the country. We do more heart transplants than anybody else in the world. We do more liver transplants than anybody else in the city. And clearly one of the things that we need to do is in identifying an increasing group of patients like yourself who liver transplantation is not appropriate, but the liver is a very nice organ because it regenerates. And you can take out a pretty significant portion of the liver, and the liver will regenerate enough to keep us okay if we can get rid of the parts that were diseased. And the key is, how do you identify that? So um, maybe at a future time, we could have Dubai Lee come and talk about some of our imaging technology that we're using in the operating room, not just in liver disease, but also in prostate cancer and diseases that are not related to cancer and heart disease. Um, so we have a very strong commitment. I'm not specifically aware of that aspect, but bringing that kind of technology to Cedars is kind of a simple thing because we already built the infrastructure of how to ask and answer the questions. I'll send you what I've seen. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think the bigger picture, which is the picture that we're all thinking about, is, is you know, eyes are only so good. And when you're in an operating room and you're looking to resect things that are below the level of, of ability that an eye can see, you need other technology. And as we try and get tumor margins, margins around the tumor of normal tissue to make sure all the cancer is removed, we need something more than just the naked eye. And the robot doesn't help us with that. So the robot helps the doctor in the operating suite, but it as yet doesn't help us know what the demarcation is between normal and abnormal. And whether it's 3D or even 4D to try and find that. And you also might benefit from, from uh, uh, meeting Dr. Frass. Uh, Radiation is generally not something that is used frequently in neuroendocrine tumors, but we have the world authority uh, and, and Dick Frass, who came from Michigan, uh, and Dick's claim to fame, he's a physicist, so he's not a, not, not a physician, but his claim to fame is basically 3D conformal radiation therapy to do exactly what you're talking about in the surgical suite. He discovered that to give radiation therapy. And these are the kinds of technologies that we have to exploit to kind of move the needle. And I'd love to see that information. And congratulations. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I, I just can you hear me? Sure. Can you speak on I, the mic, Randy, so it's on the... I just have a question. I just have a question. I'm a logistic person who has the bottom line. Uh, the, the patients that saw Dr. Wollen, I am Dr. one of Dr. Wollen's patients, and I really do believe I'm a miracle so far. And uh, he promised me I was going to live longer than five months, four and a half years ago, and he has kept his promise. And all, there's many of us here who have the same story and who went to see him. And of the many, many patients, and of course he had so many patients, it was a very difficult uh, a time for him to, to uh, uh, with his time. I think he did, he did so good for many of us. What is your vision of the person you hire, at what capacity, with the patients, the patients who are now allocated to Dr. Hendafar or the other doctor, I don't know the name because I know Dr. Hendafar where I was allocated, what is your vision about where we all are going to stand when the head of um, the neuroendocrine uh, cancer is going to come in? Is he going to be hands on each of us like Dr. Wollen was? Is, or is he going to be hands on with the doctors that we, uh, we go to? 
and the presentation that you have to him as you consider you know having him on the staff what is the what is the presentation um that part of it that you're going to give him that you're going to ex expect him to see each one of us and look at each one of us or do the allocation and i'm sure, sorry sure, that's sure. such a long question no no so so first and this is this is a little tongue-in-cheek but never assume that it's a him <laughs> and as a woman, if you should put it out there as, as possibly a him or a her. Um, I can't guarantee you that it'll be a him. Um, and the expectation is that this person will be hands-on. So that you, you will expect, and you should expect, that after this person is identified and recruited and arrives, that each and every one of you will have that person available to you to help manage and oversee your care. Period. So you're saying we'll go back, quote, they will be Dr. Wolin in a sense that we will be going back to No, the, Dr. Wolin's in Kentucky. No, 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 no. Let, let me answer. I, I get the question. I, I get the question. We're not, patients don't, I don't, I don't believe that patients should bounce around. Okay, there are many, many of you may have found that you, the care that you're getting from Dr. Hendefar, who's an excellent physician, uh, you're comfortable with. But what we're doing is we're bringing in a leader in our neuroendocrine program and that person will be available to you so that you can seek out consultation, care, and management by that person. And, and we're not looking to replace Dr. Wolwin's patients with this new doctor. What we're looking for is the next decade to 15 years of clinical research and care of neuroendocrine patients at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center. We're not looking for the next three months or six months. We're looking for the next decade of growth so that you can all have your needs met when you see patients at Cedars. And we never uh, require you to stay with Dr. A or Dr. B. Those are always personal decisions. And the person that comes will be available to all of you, obviously not on day one because then it would be overwhelming, but in a time and a way that would allow you to have his or her expertise. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. I read last year that Cedar was, Cedars was slated to not be a Medicare provider. Can you speak to that? Well, probably not, but maybe Stephanie can. But I can tell you that, that um, in, the, in the meetings that I'm in, uh, let me back up for a second. Cedars is the largest care provider in Southern California. Medicare is a huge population of people that want to see doctors at Cedars. Um, the, the government, your government, has not always made it so easy because they give <laughs> Medicare lots of different names and they often give it names that exclude certain providers from providing you care. So the best way that I can answer that for you is to say the following. We want to be your health care deliverer. We want you to be advocates for your own care by identifying the plans that allow that to continue. And we recognize that the financial interaction in terms of what it costs to receive health care in this country can be substantial. But when you're permitted through your plan to see us, we will take care of you, whether you're on Medicare or anything else. And Stephanie can be a little bit. I could probably more. answer a little bit of that. Wait, wait, wait hold tight. Oh, so if there's no more questions, a couple more, and then I'll turn it over to Stephanie. Uh, I, I was just wondering if you could speak to the volume of neuroendocrine patients that Dr. Woolen has left, and if the longer term vision is to ramp back up to those levels, only because I think Rainey mentioned it a little bit. Sometimes Dr. Woolen felt like he was a little stretched thin with the volume of patients, and maybe some of the people who aren't local have kind of falling off a little bit since he's left. We just kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so um, I, I, want to, I want to choose my words carefully. Um, we would like to see this being the biggest neuroendocrine program in the country, period. And we will provide all the resources necessary to get there. Uh, Dr. Wolin's transition was not anticipated, was not chosen, was a personal choice. People have reacted to that in different ways. The way we've reacted to that is to ensure that as we go forward over the next longer period of time, you will have every aspect and available care 
that you think Cedar should deliver and that we hope you would want to come here to have delivered. And it's not about transferring Dr. Wolin's patients from A to B. I kind of never viewed it as Dr. Wolin's patients. I know, you know, I take care of more kidney cancer patients than most other people in the country. I don't view them as my patients. I view them as people that want to come and receive their care at Cedars where I am. And I hope that you'll want to do that at Cedars. Because it's not just Dr. Wolin, or was not Dr. Wolin. If Dr. Wolin needed interventional radiology, it was somebody else. If they needed surgery, it was someone else. And I understand that people want captains of their ship, and we want you to have a captain of your ship to kind of manage your care, and you'll have it. Yes, ma'am. Um, to tag on to that just a little bit, um, my name is Beth. I, I'm from San Diego, so I'm one of those people that do drive up. <laughs> up here, Dr. Wallen's patients, and he was overwhelmed, but when we're talking about the support staff right now, you know, we're down to two, with Tina and with Hong, and so are there any thoughts to kind of bring that back up, because it's difficult right now on them to get back to people in a timely manner, because they are covering so many patients, and again, with three different doctors that they're trying to navigate with. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll leave that uh, for Stephanie to talk about the logistics, but I, I want to talk about that from a different perspective. Um, this is a large institution. Um, this disease is incredibly important to each of you that sits here in this auditorium. We have lots of patients to take care of. And what we have to do is we have to distribute the efforts across a large number of, of people. I would encourage you all to think about how you might be able to support CEDARS neuroendocrine program in support of the things that you've just talked about. Because one can wait for the institution to arrive at your doorstep and support it. The other is to be an advocate for your own, uh, own disease and present the institution with the resources necessary to make sure that there are groups of people dedicated to supporting neuroendocrine patients. So I, I would ask you to be creative. We're certainly going to do our part to replace people, add capacity, and continue to build the volume so that when you come here, you have a positive experience. We believe in that, we like that. Um, but I think we can partner in that as well. And I would hope you think about that. One more question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good so, morning, my name's Todd Gilman. So along those lines, uh, from Cedars, I've, I've never really seen plan of what those, where, where the neuroendocrine program is going. And you talk about resources and advocacy. Uh, is, there, is there a roadmap or is there going to be a roadmap or what was presented to the candidate that you're, um, that you're interviewing and, and vetting? Yeah, so, so I think, I, I think that the best way that I can, I can answer that is uh, um, the following. Um, there are many cancers where the number of people that struggle with that cancer are pretty modest. Um, and oftentimes the cancers that are pretty modest in frequency don't get their fair share of the assets in support of those patients and those diseases. I've struggled in a disease for 30 years where um, that's absolutely been the, the case. Uh, so I, to, to, to think that there would be a strategic plan embedded inside of rare, rarer cancers, mm -hmm. it's, it's best to look at that from my perspective as what do we as an institution, what, where are we as an institution committed? We're, we're committed to the highest quality care for every person that chooses us as their care provider, whatever cancer they have. Secondly, we're committed to providing them with an experience, I'm a patient, a, a, an experience that is commensurate with coming to Cedars in terms of getting through the system, getting into the system, getting through the system, and having it in a way that is acceptable. We're also committed to making discoveries in diseases that have unmet medical needs neuroendocrine tumors being one of those. We're also committed to partnering with you as individuals and as a group 
about developing a strategic vision for cedars with neuroendocrine tumors if you're so inclined. If on the one hand you view that from the perspective of what will you do for me, it might be wise, and you know, this is, I'm, I'm talking to very astute grown-up people with lots of experience, and I'm talking to you as, as, as the adults that you are, is it's how can we partner? Because it's the partnership that will get us both where we want to go. Uh, can you kind of expound on uncomputed? <coughs> I, I keep hearing what you're saying, but yet, are you saying we need to get petitions? Are you saying we need to donate money? I'm kind of confused with what you're saying. So I, so I, th I think advocacy um, takes place in many venues. And when you look across the country, in terms of advocacy for disease, many of the things that you can imagine are true. It's advocacy in terms of a relationship with the state and federal government. It's advocacy in relationship with the institution. It's advocacy in the relationship to creating dollars that could be used to offset what might not, not otherwise be available. It's a basket of opportunities that you as an organization that you can choose and identify how you choose to go forward. Um, I don't think that rare diseases and neuroendocrine tumors are pretty rare diseases are going to get the federal government to change how they deliver resources to some of the major cancers. So you're going to have to go and pound the pavement and you're going to have to figure out who the people are to talk to and you're going to have to raise your visibility and you're going to have to have your annual walks or whatever it is that you're going to do and you're going to have to get people to identify that you're an organization that can be reckoned with and as such have a voice in the care of your of people like yourselves or in the future as they come along that's advocacy that's all thank you Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I've heard so much about this wonderful support group, and so it really is an honor. You know, support groups by and large are very difficult to maintain and keep going, and we said, tend to really struggle, let's say, for example, with our breast cancer support group as far as participation goes. So to have this kind of a turnout on a monthly basis is really impressive. So, do you mind? I thank you because I think you spearhead a lot of it. My name is Stephanie Chang. Um, I um, am a nurse. I have my master's in oncology nursing. I worked 21 years at UCLA and then was recruited over here 16 and a half years ago as the clinical uh, director for operations. So basically what I do is I oversee the running of the cancer center. Um, and so the individuals that ultimately report to me are, are the nurses. Uh, your secretaries, management assistants, and various other supportive care, service group, etc. And I also have palliative care, radiation, bone marrow transplant. So I have a, a conglomerate of uh, departments and specialties. But I know I've been asked questions um, exactly what are we going to do with the neuroendocrine program as it relates to nursing. You and many of you who have been with Dr. Wollen for many years, in fact, he interviewed me for this position. Um, are well aware of his triple hit that he used to have with Arpi and Harumi and Faye. And so I've seen a lot of transition in Dr. Mullen's practice over the years and as Dr. Figlin alluded to, he was a generalist. In fact, a majority of his patients were breast when he was in his early days prior to becoming completely um, neuroendocrine. So we've seen a tremendous transition. His team obviously has evolved over years, as, as you have seen, and I think I've met several of you when I've been rounding in the exam area. And I used to pick Dr. Mullen's clinic to round, and you know why? Because he was always a little tardy to your appointments. <laughs> <laughs> so I always had an opportunity to get in, sit down in the exam room, and actually have a conversation um, with many of you, which has been very rewarding. Your feedback was um, extremely important to me as well as to the Cancer Center. So from that standpoint, I know we're asking, uh, looking at the future with this recruitment 
of replacing Arpy, whose last day, as you said, is tomorrow. And we had a big retirement party for her yesterday. And you cannot believe the outpouring of the individuals that showed up. It's such a tribute to her. And uh, we are going to bring her back as a volunteer. And she promised me a half day. I'd like to have her three days, but that's another issue. So she said, let me start as a half day. So we have posted her position. We will be recruiting for her position. The difficulty with this is when you have a physician and a practice team, they have to get along. So it's tantamount that this physician we recruit interview the candidates. They have to. Um, just like Dr. Wolin's team with the triple nurses that he had, he interviewed Tina. He had to interview Tina. They have to be able to get along. They have to mesh. Uh, these groups work so tightly together. Dr. Fidlin has a nurse he's worked with for 25 years, I believe, that has followed him from institution to institution very collaborative, very tight. So we will post the position, but most importantly, that position, who the candidates have to be interviewed by the physician that we're recruiting um, once they arrive here. So that's where we are on that note. We thank Han, we thank Tina for doing an incredible job um, handling the neuroendocrine group. I think when we talked, somebody asked about volume. I have to tell you, we haven't, I expect it, because I keep, I do the census, I look at the numbers, I'm the volume person, I'm the operations person, always looking at um, census, new patients, consults, all of those things. I will tell you from a standpoint of volume, we haven't skipped a beat. In fact, our volume year to date, less Dr. Wollen, is uh, up by about 3%, and those are big numbers. On the average clinical day, we see between, we have 500 to 525 visits in the cancer center. So we are very, very busy. Um, I can definitely tell you by Dr. Hendafar's clinic, for many of you who have transitioned your care to him, um, we've seen his numbers grow exponentially with, with all of you. So um, it hasn't had a, a significant impact on, on our um, volume. But speaking of volume, for many of you that have been coming for years and years, um, you'll notice that we have really started to grow, to outgrow our capacity. And it's a struggle. We are landlocked. Um, we have to work with what we've got, which is basically 75,000 square feet down in the World of Cancer Center. So we're always looking at opportunities um, to rebuild, increase capacity. Right now, we are probably in one of the worst constructions I have ever been through in my 16 and a half years here, and I've been through a lot of construction down there. This is the closing down of half of the infusion center. Um, that project was supposed to take, the first phase, we're in phase one right now, was supposed to take eight months. We are now at 11 months. We're hoping to complete that phase um, by the middle of December. What that, what, what that allow us is it's going to be completely renovated, it's going to be beautiful, um, and it's going to be what we call pods. So there's these circular pods, and you know I can always share that with you later, but we will have um, 12 pods. So the first half is going to be completed mid-December, but then we have to have the state come out and license it. It takes two to three months for the state to come out and license. Once that space is licensed, we will move over into the new space and we will start the second phase, which is to renovate the second half of the infusion area. It will be a mirror image of the phase one. The difficulty um, with all of this construction is we've had to move patients off-site into the medical office towers. It's been very, very difficult for patients, and it's been very difficult for staff to have them split. So, you know, we're looking mid summer of next year of having everything licensed and then the long infusion area to be opened uh, for business at full capacity. So that's one area we're looking at. Another area where I think many of you have been our long long long-term patients, you've noticed that we really are busting out the seams in the exam area. We are at full capacity in the exam area. So what we're looking for in the future, two to three years down the line, is we're going to take the space where our physicians currently reside and we are going to transition them over to offices in the Thalian buildings. We are going to take that space and we are going to add hopefully 13 additional exam rooms, an additional waiting area. For many of you that get your labs drawn, how horrendous is that lab, right? And, and, it's, and especially when we're giving you letters to, to stand in line. Um, not very patient friendly from a patient experience standpoint. It's um, not you know, ideal. 
So we're going to look at a new draw station, a waiting area for the lab, um, those kinds of things. I think the one thing that's a little bit disconcerting, you as a patient, I'm a patient there as well, is when you get your labs drawn, um, you have a, a waiting line out there, but everybody's watching you. There's no privacy. And you know the worst thing we did, and we made errors, let me tell you, and I was involved in planning previously, is to have that phlebotomy area off the waiting area. Not a good idea. Um, but of course, hindsight's always better. So we're looking at uh, relocating the lab, making it much more user-friendly and a better patient experience. Um, other things that we are currently involved in, and Dr. Figlin's very involved <laughs> in along with me, is we are going to be going up an electronic medical record. Eventually, all of you will have access to your records um, for a patient, for, as far as patient um, portals go. We're probably about 18 months away from that but we are in the throes of building the electronic record now. We're also building what we call Beacon, the order set that uh, is part of the electronic record through EPIC. And we think that we will go live with that, we're hoping by the end of next year. So we'll, we'll be completely electronic with the rest of the institution. The inpatient is all up on electronic. Um, all the ambulatory clinics are up on electronic. We are one of the very last to go up along with solid organ and they're going up at the same time we are. So there is a tremendous amount of activity that's happening down at the Cancer Center. Um, in addition to all of these, you know, IT changes, construction changes, et cetera. So please bear with us. We think that we can do a better job for the patient experience, so I'd love your feedback. It's very important to us. Um, I think that um, based on our volume, which has grown exponentially over the last five years, and now that we're landlocked and we are at capacity, we really have to look at different processes and ways with which to you know, navigate you through the system um, so that it works well. <coughs> most importantly is number one is you. You are by far the most important things to us. So, um, and I really take that to heart. I'd be very, very receptive to any comments or suggestions that you have. Are there any, any questions? Yes. Are you saying that you're going to totally be completely electronic? Because I've heard horror stories how people have gone to the hospital, computers are down, and they can't get treated. What happens? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something. About Cedar sinai we have gone down before on the inpatient <clears throat> unit. Um, but they have a whole backup. It's not a backup system. They have a whole system on paper that they work off of when they get into this mode. So for example, um, I actually was the incident commander two weeks ago for the hospital. And uh, what happened is there was a power outage and it knocked out the Saperstein building and it knocked out our, out our lower level area in the short infusion area. And, but for those that are on the electronic record, they went to a completely uh, paper system. And so they actually have emergency backup systems to be able to do that. There is a whole algorithm of which to follow. I will tell you, going up an electronic record is difficult. It really is. We, um, I think, I think, quite frankly, no offense, Dr. Fidlin, but I do believe that the nursing staff is going to probably adopt it a little bit more readily than the physicians. And um, so we'll be working very diligently with the physicians. It's going to be, you know, all order entry is going to be online now. You know, you all have seen the paper orders that they all wrote, Dr. Mm -hmm. Wollin's orders. That will all be electronic, and it is going to definitely be a challenge. So, you know, but I think it's going to, ultimately it's going to be worthwhile. Yeah. You were yes. going to speak to Medicare. I will, yeah. Medicare, um, and I know what you're um, re referencing. Medicare is an interesting um, organization. <laughs> and I will tell you a large percentage of our patients at Cedars are Medicare. So Medicare is not going to go away. What becomes a little bit challenging and a little bit different is that you can see Medicare as an HMO plan. It's the Medicare HMO. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah. So you really That's have to I decide. To, I just wanted you to make that clear. Yeah. It's the don't HMO it's component. Right. And I know we have a phenomenal contracting department that has worked very, very hard um, to add on some of these programs. So um, we've just recently added on um, a couple additional plans. And right now I'm going to be in a conference call for maybe next week with Cigna. Good. And looking Good. at, and because they have many, many questions, especially clinically, that we, that we need to answer for them. 
And so that's going on behind the scenes. But it is, it's, it's the Medicare HMO that tends to be a little, put a little bit of a wrench in things. Yes. Yeah. Open enrollment. So to figure out who to go with. Yeah. I mean, Open I'm, enrollment. It I'm just already started, overwhelmed with everything anyway, let alone that. You know, I have to say, I feel very, very uh, empathetic for the consumers because I struggle with understanding these plans, and I'm actually fairly knowledgeable. Yeah. But when you have a layperson that isn't dealing with these on a day-to-day -day basis, it's really, really difficult. All I can really recommend is if you, it's open enrollment now, and I think you have through March, maybe? To do the final, or is it December 7th? December 7th. December 7th. December 7th. Wow. December 7th. I'm an agency for 20 years, and I'm a broker, so I do know everything about health insurance. And I would be happy to answer questions for you. Well, that would be wonderful, because there's nuances in each of the plans, and then you really do have to know what plan, what coverage those plans provide. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to be very careful. And there was an article in the LA Times just this last weekend, and they were saying it's not just that you look at your provider; you have to make sure that that the hospital facility that you're seeing is also a provider for that. Mm -hmm. So it goes hand in hand. Um, if you are, if our, all of our faculty physicians' contracts are the same as the hospitals, it becomes a little bit trickier with private practice. So um, you re you really do have to you have, you have to do your research. You do. You really well, have to do your research. Send things in the mail. It looks like you really don't have any coverage. Yeah. I mean, their Say stuff. It's like they it's just their little postcards. You know, whatever. You're like, well, okay. I don't see how this co company would ever help me. Can't hear you. Difficulty navigating the insurance companies. Yeah. 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 It's 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 truly a challenge. And we, I will tell you, for authorizations now, um, PPOs, it used to be that we many times we didn't have to get authorizations for PPOs. Not now. A large percentage of PPOs are requiring authorizations, mm -hmm. especially for first time chemotherapies, um, imaging studies. They're not as um, generous as they used to be. For many of you on Sandal Statin, we have to call specialty pharmacies to get those approved for you. Um, and so it, it is challenging. It really is. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I usually have a very loud voice, too. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for clarifying the sequence of events with uh, hiring the new uh, nurse for the NET team. In the interim, mm -hmm. um, what do you anticipate? because it sounds like it will be at least a few months until the new oncologist comes on board. What do you anticipate with the volume of all the sandostatin patients and shots? You know, I think it's going to be status quo. I, Tina can handle some of them. The others we have in the nurse visit room, and we have backup for her for coverage. RP was backing her up for injections when necessary. But what happened, what I promised that group once Dr. Wollen left, is that nobody was going to lose their job and nobody lost their jobs. And I felt very strongly about that. So, but what we, you have to do when you don't have a physician, you have to redeploy these people to cover other areas. That's the only way you can justify keeping the positions. So my justification for keeping Tina was to continue to run the neuroendocrine program because it was vital because of all of you, large volume of patients, and obviously we had to keep Hong. One reason is to support Dr. Hindafar and then of course to support you. I know many of you see her before you get your injections, and then Tina, to, Tina provides the injections. What we had RP do is we had RP float. RP used to cover all kinds of diseases with Dr. Wollen. It wasn't just neuroendocrine. So she was the perfect person to float to multiple clinics to be able to support them. And I have to tell you, she thoroughly enjoyed it because she's got a tremendous amount of knowledge. And then she would back Tina up. We will have the same kind of backup coverage for Tina that we that RP provided. That will not be a problem. But we really need to be careful about the candidate we select. That it it works for Tina, it works for Hong, and it works for this new physician. Yeah, but I think we're going to be okay. Yes. Uh -huh. There's just one quick question about Hong. Do you have presently a backup for Hong if she's sometimes <coughs> not able to make the appointments? 
Is there a backup person for home? No, there is not. For a nurse practitioner position, no, right. no. Mm -mm. We have two nurse practitioners. One works with the lung cancer group and Dr. Nakali, and then Dr. Woolen. That was that was the only MPS. Thank you. You said you had over 500 patients in the cancer center mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. What percentage of those cancer patients, if you know, are neuroendocrine? You know, that's a good question, and I don't break it down by specialty, so I, I really wouldn't know. Well, I'm asking because it's the, it's the most increasing cancer mm -hmm. today, and we all feel like stepchildren. I know you do, yeah. and I no, and I understand that. But so we feel like we're being neglected, and now Dr. Newton said, "Well, make a bigger noise," but it's a small group. So I, I guess we're all curious to know what percentage are we? Are we two percent, five percent? But it's a, a rising element. You know, that's, I mean, that's a very good question. We could certainly break it down by it percentages, um, just looking basically at diagnosis codes. Um, we just haven't. And, um, I mean, at least when Dr. Wollum was here, I kind of, I, I didn't know what the percentage was as opposed to multiple physicians. I will tell you, he wasn't the busiest. Um, no, he, he wasn't, I know, he was, he, he was not the busiest, hard to believe. One of the top busiest, but not the busiest uh, oncologist. Um, but I think what is unique for him and all of you is it's a, it is a very different kind of disease. And it, um, like, you, like Dr. Figlin said, it takes multidisciplinary for all of you. You've seen multiple specialists. But I, it has to, it's, it's, it's a different disease. It's not um, breast cancer where we get, we've given radiation and chemotherapy. I mean, you could be through surgery, you could be Stanton. Some of you will get infusions. It's, it's a very different subset. And so I don't know even that the volume matters. I think the amount of time it takes to meet with each of you and go over your symptoms, it's, it's really, it, even though it's a rare disease, I think it's very time consuming. So I don't know that volume is as important as just making sure that we meet your needs and you feel that you're supported. That's the most important thing. Yes. Hi. Um, in following up your question, we do. We've been told we're the zebras, so we're the rare ones. But we've also been hearing that we're very high maintenance, and we take so much care. Each of us we're having usually four major scans a year. <coughs> Our shots, we understand, are very expensive and lucrative for whatever hospital we go to. So I just wanted to ask you, like, are we really so un, like such an non-lucrative group that we shouldn't have full services? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. You know what? Money should have nothing to do with this. It's about patient care. It has nothing to do about the economics in that sense. I think that it's rare. Here's what happens at Cedars, and we have a couple diseases. It is a rare tumor type, but, what we, but we see so many of you. So for us at the Cancer Center, the neuroendocrine group is a big part of what we do. It really is. And we have another program, sarcoma. Sarcoma is extremely rare. What is that, 1% to 2%? Um, of patients with cancer that will ever get sarcomas. That's a big program too. But it's but if you look across the country, it's a small entity when you look at cancer care. So I think I don't think that that makes any difference. It's hard to have somebody like Dr. Wollen, who ha I know there are multiple people out there that they feel he saved their lives. He diagnosed them when they've been misdiagnosed at multiple places. And, um, and boy, you start to build that kind of confidence and faith in that provider, and then you no longer have them. Very difficult, especially those relationships that you build. They're critical. Critical. Um, just to go on a little more with, with that, but just from sort of a different angle. Um, John has had you know, a tumor for 17 years, and I'm a, a support person. Mm -hmm. And so we've come over here for quite quite a long time. And, you know, it's just long enough since the end of July when Dr. Dr. Willen has left to 
kind of assimilate into the experience that we're, that we're having. And you know, I'm hearing this morning about um, you know patient care and being user friendly, and also about the you know follow up outside the uh, uh, scheduling office. And I'm sort of a little immune to that kind of thing. It comes on the internet all the time. I give feedback to what you think A B C D. Okay, um, but we're here today, and and one of the things I just I just want to say from our experience is that, and from both of us having been managers in our own field, which is different than medicine, is that the team and, and who you interface with, each time you come in the door, they smile, they look at you, they can say your name, they know you, um, just the whole support that, that you get. And it, it's, it's a little bit more than being in limbo. It, it's the whole thing on, on human relations that, that builds all this. And the whole training of the staff behind and, and just who is interfacing with whom and, and how they're feeling today. It, it's so critically important, um, uh, not only to our neuroendocrine folks, but to any kind of cancer and any kind of thing that that people are, are struggling with and is, is your support staff and who they are and that they feel good about what's going on behind the scenes as well. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Speaking of operations, I know you're in charge of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the volume of patients going into the cancer center, I find that the uh, scheduling takes, you know, you get a, a number, you say, come in at 10 o'clock, and by the time you see Hong or the Dr. Andy Farr, it's three hours later. If we can cut down on the traffic and the volume of people parking and going in and waiting, if you say 10 o'clock, and I could expect to be seen at least an hour later, I am very grateful to be coming here, and I don't want to complain about that, but I'm just trying to see maybe it will be helpful for everybody. Especially for us, we're still working. Mm -hmm. We take off time and then we waste uh, two hours waiting, three to four hours. So I, maybe now I'm starting to think if I get a 10 o'clock appointment, I'll come in at 12 and I'll be on time. <laughs> Is there, do, do, you, do you have any idea what the delay might be that you're not being seen timely? Is it a backup of Dr. Hendafar's clinic or? I wish I knew, you know, if they say there's no room. There's no available room, that's one. Or they're uh, held up somewhere else with, a, the with patient. another patient. Or yesterday it was our piece uh, going away, so I understood that. But I'm, and one time I came in, uh, my appointment was canceled and no one called me. Well, that's not good. That, that, that's so, like, uh, unfortunately, I don't know, because I've been to a different, a couple, couple different places. places and it, it's I'm like just trying I to go, help with I the volume of people coming in. Yeah. You know, if we would have freed up the space if we had been seen in that no, yeah, the space had been freed up. What we're doing down there right now is we are actually, we just had a staff focus group to talk about patient experience so we can get their input um, about what kind of process flows we can do to increase efficiency in issues like this. Um, we also have another group um, that is meeting. We have a patient advisory group that meets with us as well. So, um, and obtaining that feedback. I think that's why, you know, we didn't get that kind of <laughs> feedback and complaints sometimes. You all are very, we're very protective of him. And I do think he got better though, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I think Tina kept him in line. So, um, that was one of her missions, bless her heart. Is keeping him in line. So anyway, but I do know that when he was with you, he took an extraordinary time and very patient. And he shared a lot of himself, too. He wasn't just a physician. Yeah. I'd like to go back to um, Medicare and Medi-Cal and Peter Sinai. Mm -hmm. what, what are you recommending? Honestly, I can't, I, as far as coverage and things go, mm -hmm. yes. um, I mean, we do Medicare. We uh, do not take Medicare HMO. The, a lot of those um, those types of arrangements uh, that with the HMO component, they have different providers in different uh, institutions. It's a very it's a very narrow network. You've heard about narrow networks. That's a narrow network, which means 
Less choices of providers, less choices of facilities. That's what a narrow network is. So, but we do Medi Medi. We do Medi Cal and Medicare. Yeah, we take. We have the highest Medi Cal population in the Western states here. So we just that we take for percentage wise for Medi Cal. Yeah. To opt out on all of this. So, just be careful when you look and see what your profile. I know it's very confusing. I know, I, it's very confusing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, going back to support, hopefully we get the right person with uh, Tina and Hong, but I see Dr. Hennifer now. And the support staff, when you talk about secretary of people, I live in Phoenix. I got really used to Andrew where I could give him an email, phone call. If he didn't answer, he returned the call, email, return, seven calls unanswered by Hennifer staff, the eighth one. They lost the paperwork, third time that they had lost the paperwork. Then we asked for their email address and we could start doing this stuff mm -hmm. instead of trying to get them on the phone. Not allowed to give out that information. Now, I hear Figlin say something about being customer-centric, patient-centric. Mm -hmm. That needs to get to the support staff, because right now I'll tell you, I don't feel like it's there. Do you, um, do you work with Halle? Um, we tried to uh, recently since she came back. Uh, it was Robert, but like I say, right now, it's I not working. I can get a hold of him. Okay, or well, I'll address that with was, them. Getting yeah. a hold of him, if he didn't get back to you that day, he got back to you the next day. So I'll address that with that group because actually, Dr. Hendafar has uh, one, two, 2.5 MAs right now. Um, and part of the reason was to take this group on. So Halle, you know, she does all the authorizations for, for, for the net group. And then he's got a big GI, other GI population that he has 1.5 MAs working on that too. So if you're not getting your needs met, we, we really have to address that. So I'll speak with, with them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there a special number we should be calling them? The number that's given, yeah, that's given to you. I actually would not have that off the top of my head. But if you, it's the same number that you would have called in the past. That's obviously not being answered, correct? You're one of our, our Arizona people, huh? Yeah. Yeah, there's several of them, actually. Okay. Part of, part of the problem is that even though one point, I mean, two and a half MA sounds fabulous, is that you've already addressed it, the insurance companies are requiring, and it's because of the it's really because of the Affordable Care Act. They're required to get authorization on everything. So it's going to slow yeah. everything. Down. Yeah, our authorizations um, are anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes. Um, getting scans, getting chemotherapy. Um, sandostatin is a tough one. We usually are very successful, and I do have to give Halle credit for that because she's a master at getting approval for those things. We have Tina on the phone with specialty pharmacy. She and I have discussed that. So um, it's it's very challenging, but honestly, it shouldn't be impacting you. It shouldn't be. Yes. Stephanie, I just want to um, thank you for being here to one-on-one -on -one answer these questions yeah. because as a group, you can tell that there's been a lot of um, unknowns in the last few months. And it's wonderful for us to know that we have a channel now of loose communication. And if there are issues, like I think that definitely is an issue, the one that the gentleman from Arizona mentioned. Um, my feeling is that we need to have more of a sense of the team that's here. I mean, we talk about the net team, but there isn't evidence of it. And a central phone number where I, apparently what used to be Dr. Wallen's phone number has now become that number, mm -hmm. but it's not really official. It's not, you've reached the neuroendocrine team at Cedar sinai And I think something like that and moves in that direction would be enormously helpful. Okay. Just so people know, like maybe if they're going to see Dr. Hendafar, but their main issue that's really urgent is GI, then maybe they would even be somebody would let them know about Dr. Mediza Day. So mm -hmm. maybe they could get in earlier to see him. Or there's so many doctors on the team, and many of us have seen all of yeah. them. But sometimes something's more urgent than other things, and if it's going to take a while to see the oncologist, rather than just waiting for a month and a half. Um, yeah, I, you need to get in. I think we are certainly willing to help as a group, and 
um, communicate some of the ideas and, and I think having more of a presence for the team itself that there is a net team here and um, at, when the new person comes on board yeah. that's even more of to add to the team. And I agree with you. I think yeah. uh, once we get this new person on board, keep your fingers crossed because I think it would be an excellent choice, I think then you'll have that presence. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit difficult to feel like you have a presence when um, you're being shifted over, being offered another physician um, who was part of the team but not, not the full focus of the team like Dr. Wolin. So I think once we get this individual into place, I think you're going to see a lot of that come back again. Sure. To where you've got one central person with what you uh, want to be seen by. And please, 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 if you, as Dr. Figlin uh, alluded to, if you want to change providers from Dr. Hendafar to this new person, please feel free. Please feel free. Um, you know, you do what's best for you. Huh? Isn't that going to happen automatically? And just as says. when you went to see Dr. Hendifer, for many of you, you came in as a new consult, new to his practice. If you want to go back, you would go in as a new consult to this new person's practice. All it would mean would just be switching over. Because there may be some patients that aren't going to switch over. It, you know, they may feel comfortable with Dr. Hendifer, but it's up to each of you individually, your decision and what you want to do. And we're certainly supportive of whatever decision you make. Yeah. Do you think it would be possible once the candidate is confirmed, um, but may, may not have started yet, that we could invite them to speak to the group um, ahead of the, the avalanche of appointments? <laughs> like scare, um, no, I scare yes. away. I'll speak to Dr. Figlin about that, but I, I certainly don't see why not. Sort of an introductory. It would be nice as well. I mean, I know Dr. Wolin, we did get something official. It was kind of after we all knew, I think. Yeah. So yeah. it might. Well, you know, this is a great venue, right, to get communication through. So as soon as we know something, we will obviously contact you and let you know immediately because you, you need to know. It's, it's very important. Yeah. I came in late because of traffic. When do you expect this to happen? Dr. Figlin believes uh, that the contract will probably be signed by the end of this year and that this person will short, start after the new year. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're banking on. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so thank much you for being much. here. Um, you know what? That's a very good question. We had our person here, Sarah Edwards. Um, but she would be your contact person, um, and we'd be happy to facilitate that for you. Yeah, because you wanted to go to the neuroendocrine part, not the. No, yeah. yeah, not the at large. I agree. Uh -huh. Sarah, yeah. Edwards? Sarah Edwards. Yeah, she would be another. Or uh, Sarah Andrews. Sorry, Andrews. Another option I might add is that our LACNETS group is a 501c3, and if you really want to make sure it stays with our community, <coughs> that's a way to do it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Ruth Castro um, had was instrumental in having Senator De Leon proclaim California uh, Neck Cancer Day this year. And she did something that apparently people had tried to do for five years. And um, this beautiful proclamation from Senator De Leon is here. And we thought it would be wonderful to take a photo with the proclamation to send to him and thank him for honoring our group and our special day this year. Thank you for all being here. I think Thank it was you. very important Thank you. to have a good showing and communicate our message. And I know, you know a lot of you traveled far and took off time from work. So thank you for coming out. And um, we're going to skip December and happy holidays to everyone and resume back in January. Happy holidays. Thanks. 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 So let's take a photo. For, uh,